Welcome, RipeWave Audio community. And uh, thanks for your patience as I was getting started up here. I'm in the process of uh, figuring out how to do more with these live streams, but I decided to just get this started and, and revert back to what we have been doing. And on this live stream, what we're going to be talking about is our initial configuration of the Marantz Cinema 50 AVR audio video receiver, which we got a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you've been following this, we did our unboxing. We did our some of our initial work there. And now we're going to do a little deeper here. Uh, perhaps uh, some of you are, um, are, are already in tune with what Marantz does, but uh, hopefully we'll all get in the same page and, and uh, figure things out. I've got some notes here of um, what I'd like to cover. So what I said, first of all, um, we had to tear down this whole rack to accommodate both the uh, Marantz Cinema 50 and the Emotiva RMC1, which we're going to be doing direct comparisons of, uh, but looking them separately on their own as well. I think each has their audience and, and, uh, and uh, you know, merits on each case. But we'll know better once we get into this uh, and and be able to do some real testing. Of course, before you can do some real testing, you have to do some configuration and and setup uh, on everything. And uh, hey, uh, appreciate the feedback, uh, thanking me for the work that we're doing here. I, I hope it is valuable to everybody. And. Uh, yeah, let's let's get into some of the things I wanted to cover first. The rack itself. Now, this isn't the most ideal way to set up equipment. I've done it this way because I think, from a value point of view, that this is a low cost solution. A few hundred dollars, you get this VTI rack. We have a video that we've done on this when we first got this set up. We have another one in the back of the room when we do our future expansion, not too far in the future because we're going to be adding more amplifiers to the setup. Uh, part of why we're doing the Marantz Cinema 50 first over the RMC1 is because I'm waiting on another amplifier that can power our top height channels. Actually, I'll probably use it for the, the surround sound and take the Sony TAN9000ES and use that to power the ceiling speakers. But we can, of course, play with that. Now, some pros and cons with the VTI rack. Obviously, in this configuration, I have you know, not direct access to the back of this for all the wiring. And so uh, it's not as good as, let's say, having a rack in a closet. You can get around to the back and, and do all your wiring. That is ideal, but it's a lot more expensive solution. And, and if you really did do it right for this room, but I have a carpenter cut in, come in and cut in a, a hole in the wall of the closet, although I do have this capability, we might be able to do that uh, going forward. But uh, it's a very attractive unit, the, the VTI um, Iraq. And um, I can mix and match this. so. As I get different height units in, I can put in a seven inch or a nine inch rack or even a lower one. And the way I stack these up is I try to put the, the units that are generating the most heat, namely the uh, XPA1 monoblock generates the most heat, especially if I put it in class A mode. And I got that at the top. Of course, it's quite heavy to put it up to the top. And uh, I've got my Blu-ray player at the bottom, and it's also ergonomic to put the Blu-ray disc, ultra high definition disc, in, and it's just very easy to drop it down if it's if it's um, at table height. So that's why we've uh, arranged this as we did. Uh, of course, not many people would have a processor and a receiver, and that's our unique um, position here where we're doing some comparisons. So. Uh, that's why we've got it set up that way. So just a brief note about our VTA, VTI rack. Um, yeah, uh, I'm reading some of the comments here. Want to get rid of uh, 
uh, get a rack um, that has open shelves made of wire so air can circulate. Great point. And this is one of the benefits of this VTI rack. It's very open. Uh, I got good air circulation, probably better than a, a, a standard 19 inch rack without putting some fans in it. And this is the three leg version versus the four leg version. So, uh, you know, it's really open on the sides here and, and good circulation. Um, yeah, who cares says, uh, usually see the amps at the bottom or actually next to the speakers. Yeah, certainly if I was in a mixed use room, I'm sharing the room with the family and so forth. So I um, want to keep the, the equipment off the floors for the kids. Uh, but yeah, if you want to do this right and you have mono blocks, you put that right at the floor, short length of speaker wire from the amp to the tower speakers or whatever you're using. And, and that's ideal. And then run balanced cables back to your processor from, from that. So I definitely agree with that. Um, what we've done here is not necessarily ideal, but might be uh, the best for our particular situation. And you always have to um, uh, balance that out. And um, the amp weight, of course, yeah, that was um, a struggle to get it up to the top, but we did so. So that is what I wanted to cover on the um, the VTI rack and, and setting this up. And I was very careful too, and I don't know if you can see this, uh, because I'm moving things around a little bit. Uh, this is all the HDMI cable that I've got running. So I have nine HDMI cables uh, set up in here, and I've got the coming out so it's um i've got one some of these for future but i got the blu-ray is is labeled as hdmi 2 that's not that's the blu-ray out audio only and then the blue light video is uh cable uh it's hard to see it backwards here yeah cable three is blu-ray video which is there's two video uh blu-ray yeah there are two hdmi connections on the back of this Sony Blu-ray. One just does audio only, and one does uh, video and audio. So cable three goes over to the Marantz uh, HDMI port three. So I've just got this all labeled, but I can race it and restart it. And what I've done is on each end of the HDMI cable, I've got the same number. So if I want to figure out where things are going, I just trace it down. Uh, a little thing I'm doing there because I am moving things around a lot. So I don't want to put Blu-ray on it because it may not be on Blu-ray tomorrow. It may be somewhere else. So cable two, if I label both ends of cable two, I can then keep this up to date what I made on my changes. So uh, I, you know, as I said in the last video, Marantz has now documentation for the Cinema 50. They have yet to put the link right with the uh, the advertising parts of the Cinema 50 on their web page, but you can search for it on the internet and get to it, as as I did. Uh, it is a fairly large document, as they normally are from Marantz, um, and this one is over 300 pages, but there is still gaps in the documentation, and. Uh, so something simple, and I'm going to jump around here, is the cable test. So last week, we got a lot of comments coming in about why our HDMI wasn't working well with the TV. Well, it turned out to be firmware in the Cinema 50, and we ran the update, and it cleared it all up. But a lot of people suspected it could be the cables, and Marantz is known for their built-in cable tester. Now, I did find a generic document was a few years old and it doesn't cover the cinema 50 specifically and the cinema 50 documentation uh, doesn't talk about the hdmi cable test function but i was able to get it to work and uh, if this works similar to some of the others and if you pull open the door and you go what did i say it's surround mode. 
I can't read it. <laughs> I need a light. Ah, surround mode and dimmer. And if you push those for three seconds while you're not in setup, it will bring it up, but you only see it on the little porthole and you can run through the menus and do this test. Now, the documents that are posted say, well, it should go on input one of HDMI and monitor two out. And I'm not sure that's the exact positions for the Cinema 50 because it's not documented. So I was getting some failures, but then the cable was working. So I wish they would explain that further. So if you have more notes on uh, the HDMI tape cable test specific to the Cinema 50, that's a document that I am uh, hoping to, to have because that would be a nice feature to, to be able to utilize uh, to the full extent. So the question is, what DAX is Marantz using now? So what I understand is... In some cases, they've switched to ESS, but I don't know if, if that's in this model. And I've yet to take the cover off of this. So um, they were using AKM. They had the fire, the chip shortages. Um, Marantz and Denon, like many companies, moved off of AKM where they could. Uh, and ESS was one logical uh, choice. I understand Emotiva is moving from AKM to Texas Instrument when they switch to the RMC1 Plus platform next summer. So it's just another example of uh, what's going on there. Uh, so that's the note on the HDMI testing. It says, do I use official 2.1 cables? In some cases, yes. On other cases, it's what I had lying around and they just work. Uh, there was one cable I was using today. I was playing with my son on the PS5 and it was intermittently dropping out and then we swapped the cables and it worked. So I'm assuming that cable was not one of the newer ones. But my big beef, and I should start doing this as I buy cables, writing on them what they're certified to. Because more often than not, the ends of the HDMI cable don't say that they're a, a 2.0 or 2.1 uh, certified cable. Uh, it just says HDMI in most cases. Uh, so you're always safer when they, they do officially state that they're 2.1. And if I can buy cables that actually say 2.1 on them, I'd prefer that because uh, it would be easier to identify those and use those for where you need uh, the highest speed and uh, the most features out of HDMI. So going on to the next topic. Oh, come on. I'll get my little notes here. I'm... Um, so I talked about gaps in documentation. I wanted to talk about input configuration a little bit. Let's see if I can go into setup mode here. And I don't know how well you can see this. So before I get into this in general, I think Marantz does a really good job at their menus and everything. There's a few gaps and a few extra things that they could do, but I would guess that they're probably doing the menus probably as good or better than any other company out there. So if I complain about something, I would um, take it as a, a minor complaint or just a constructive criticism how to get better. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this input assign uh, feature here. And I, I really think this is good because you can go in to each one of the inputs. And so this one that says home theater, that one is actually the Apple TV that I unboxed the other week. And this one, I'm only ever going to use this with HDMI. So uh, 
it could be set to auto, it could set the HDMI, it could be set to analog. But since I know that the only output on an Apple TV is HDMI, I'm just going to hard set that to HDMI and be done with it. Uh, same with the Fire TV. Um, that's on input two. Input three is my Sony Blu-ray player. Now there's a few extra outputs on the Sony Blu-ray player. There's, for example, there's a coaxial output. I think it also has a, a optical, which, but I always use coax when, when that's available. And what you can do on uh, this is you can set it to HDMI, but you also can change the digital signal uh, to be coax one as an optional uh, input. Um, not that I would use it that much, but uh, it has that capability. And uh, I'm not using the analog output of the um, Blu-ray player. The game is the Nintendo Switch. That's always going to be just HDMI. That's fine. Uh, here's the PlayStation. Again, it's only going to be HDMI. Uh, auxiliary 2. I'm not sure I've got that on anything. I could actually turn that off. I don't know if there's a way to do that. Auto, HDMI. Well, you know what? If I leave that as auto, if I plug something in, then it's just going to work. TV audio, this is um, on the so uh, Samsung TV. There's a uh, optical output. So I've got that wired back to there in case I just want to test something out there. And the CD, I don't have anything plugged into that. So I don't actually have a CD player. But yeah, I wanted to cover this. I think this is a very good um, layout. And now I go back to my original Sony TAE 9000ES. It had the capability of choosing whether you wanted the analog or the digital and all that. Uh, it's good that I can uh, be prescriptive of how I want these to be assigned. And now if I go to the Blu-ray player, uh, what will be the automatic um, input that it will be using? So I think this is an excellent screen. They did a great job with this. So let's back out of here. Next thing I had... Um, yeah, so as far as speaker and amplifier configuration, and before I get into that, Marantz supplies these labels uh, with, with the uh, receiver, and they're color-coded. The only thing is I don't care for their color coding because once you get past the base channels, they're using the same colors for all the... Um, the extra height channels and some of the other surround ones. So I, um, I've i got my own scheme, and we'll go over that on another day. Uh, and, and I've got them color-coded right on the back of the... Um, it's, it's how I did the XLR uh, connections. Of course, there's no XLR on this, but I'll need it for the, the RMC one. So I'm not using their labels because I do not like their color coding. Um, Speaker and amp configuration. Oh, and by the way, you can go in and rename. I missed this point. You can rename your sources, which I'll um, need to go in and do this. But I can go in and, and change the name of all these sources. Like, I'm not really pleased with this one because I'd rather have this to be. Um, I'd rather have this one to say that it is the Apple TV. And I think what it got was the name that I set in the Apple TV, not knowing how it would come into the Marantz. So I'd rather just say this to be Apple TV. And I can do that. And, 
And this is an Apple TV for K. And it's the one that just came out November 4th. I got one of the first units. Yeah, no, not that. No, not that. No. Oops. 2022. And then hit OK. I might shorten it up, actually, because it starts to scroll on certain things like the porthole. It, um, it's only so many characters the portal will take. So but now that looks better. I can change this one to say Nintendo Switch, but I won't do that right now. You, you get the point. And so I will just leave out of this one. Go back. Confirm, cancel. I do notice that it goes black for a while when you're backing out of things or going into another page. So sometimes you do have to wait a few seconds. I guess I can be patient for that. So yeah, these are we can do the renames. You can actually hide sources. So if I'm not using a channel, I can hide them. I think that's really good. And if you find that certain sources are usually louder or softer than others, you can um, adjust input levels for the current source. So I guess it's for the current source. You you have to go in and out. I thought they'd list all the sources, but you have to probably go into each one, adjust them manually, and uh, up plus or minus whatever you want to do. So that was a nice on those input adjustments. So the next thing I wanted to cover here is on speaker configuration. So I'm just going to go into manual for a second. We went over this the last time a little bit and how we got this all configured. Uh, this, why is it showing four subwoofers now? That's weird. But I do have this set up for five channel plus surround backs. And I thought they'd write it as seven channels, but they do five channels plus surround back. Um, four ceiling or height channels. The, um, the front layout is top front, rear top, um, sending the front to the pre-outs. And that's, that's on the assign. All I want to do is that's the amp assign. Now here's one thing is I had originally set my speakers to small. And after I ran Odyssey, I found that it bumped these up to large. I, I want to make sure I just didn't do that by mistake or, but I just think it would be odd that Odyssey bumps those up after setting them to small uh, intentionally. Two subwoofers, one in the front, one in the back, directional. So that was one thing I wanted to mention here that um, even though I went in and set all these to small, after I ran Odyssey, the front and center got set to large. Uh, I had originally put distances in here. After running Odyssey, these were adjusted. So these are what Odyssey felt they should be. I imagine I can go in now afterwards and tweak those if I felt those weren't right. Uh, the levels, etc. Uh, Odyssey also changed these crossovers. Uh, I find it odd that it's gone now to 40 hertz. I think these were all set to 80 hertz. So, yes, yeah, surround, surround back is set to 40 hertz, and the top front to 60, and the rear to 80. Now, they're, the, all the top ones are the same model speakers. So I find that a bit odd that um, they're not the same. But again, it's doing this just on the, the feedback it's getting. And on the base, 
this is set to 120 still. So I think that was pretty much the default. And this has not been changed. So I've got on my configuration, if you've not been following this, uh, I've got three Emotiva monoblocks, one for the center, one for the left and right. And I've got the Sony TAN9000 ES five channel amp, just using four channels for the side surrounds and the back surrounds. And the Barants, we're only using four of the nine amplifiers for the height channels. And of course the subwoofers are self-powered. What I learned by reading the Marantz manual is I'm not really going to be able to use Oral 3D with the way my speakers are configured. My speakers are ceiling mount. Unless I have height mounted, like high in the front and high on the sides and high in the back, uh, Oral 3D uh, it will only be running in like two channel two-dimensional two mode. So um, more on that to come. So you know the, the, the top surrounds are not supported with the Oral 3D. Uh, so they, they won't even give it a try, is what I understand. Um, for the Odyssey setup itself, what I did was used my own tripod versus the rocket ship. So when you, when you get your Marantz receiver, it has these uh, cardboard things that look like a rocket ship and you can do different heights and put the calibration microphone, which is here, on top of it. But it also has a, a, a screw for a, a standard camera uh, mount on a tripod. I actually wanted to use it with this stand because I like you can see this type of stand. This is a great stand for doing calibration because it has an arm that can swing over your listening position and you can adjust it uh, exactly how you want it. I couldn't use this because what I needed to do is get a microphone to quarter inch camera mount, which I have coming. And then I can use this type of stand instead of a, a normal three-legged tripod. So a microphone stand with a boom arm, I think, is the best setup on, on doing that. So when I ran Odyssey, the problem I got was it does the first pass and it goes around to each of the channels. And for the first listening position, which is the main listener pen position, front and center on the my case, it's a couch. So, and um, it runs through all the speakers and then it does what some sort of a phase test. And it indicates which speakers it thinks are out of phase, meaning it's assuming you wired the positive and negative terminals in reverse or somewhere in the chain, they got reversed and um, they asked you to swap it. I felt pretty confident about my wiring not being reversed, but I figured what it's doing is because of the room acoustics, it, by the time it reaches the couch, it may be coming in out of phase and canceling out. So we don't want it to cancel out. So I listened to their suggestions and flipped the wires. And it was the front speakers, the left and right, not the center, the four heights, and the rear speakers, rear surrounds. So I swapped all those and I ran it again. And it still had a couple of speakers, like the front speakers, the, the ceiling ones resolved themselves. And then I ended up flipping them a few times and running it a few times. And it was kept on finding speakers that thought were out of phase. Ultimately, it got to the point where it was stable. Um, 
and I didn't have a problem. I, I, I think we ended up on the front going right back to the way I originally had it wired. I'm pretty sure of it. So I, I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but I felt better that it came back with no errors on that phase check and then ran through the Odyssey. And there's eight positions it goes through. It goes one front and center of the couch, left of center, right of center, in front, um, middle and left and right. So there's six. And then behind the couch, there was a left and right, but not center. And those are your eight positions. And they're all within two feet of each other, or no more than two, two feet is what they, I think they say 20 inches. So less than two feet. And um, the first time I ran it, it got hung up at like 95% complete. But that time, actually that time I ran it, I didn't bother fixing the phasing. And then when I went and fixed the phasing, I didn't have that problem that ran all the way through. So maybe um, if it really thinks something's that far out of phase, it might have trouble doing its calculations and measurements. I'm just guessing, of course. Uh, but then I noticed there was a problem there was only one sub, it only ever tested one subwoofer. What about the one in the rear? And I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I came across, let's see if I can find the right menu screen here. I think I want to go into, is it Odyssey setup? Yeah, this one. So if you go up, now remember, I went into the original setup, and we had we set two subwoofers, one at the front, one at the back. And I think it's on this channel select. And then when I went and looked at the channel select by default, it was only going to measure the one subwoofer, not both of them. So I thought that was interesting. I had to manually go in and, and change it to two speakers. Um, and then it went back and I'm going to make sure it was directional and front and rear, just as I wanted to. Now, I suppose there are times where you would just want to run um, Odyssey and not do the subwoofers or only just do one subwoofer. Uh, but I wanted to see how it did by including both of them. I might play around with this. And of course, I think it did a fairly good job. But I, when I remember how things sounded when I did this kind of manually using room um, equalization, equalization wizard and, a, and the um, mini DSP, uh, I think there's certain things like the bass was better. Uh, I think I've taken a step back on the bass calibration from when I did those manual tests with room equalization wizard, REW. Uh, so I'm not quite happy with that, but it does feel balanced. The levels are good. It's usable. Could it be better? I think so. I think I think it could do better than what it came back. Now, granted, I just ran through this once. For each pass of those eight listening positions, it takes about a minute and a half, and then you got to move the microphone, and it's... All in all, you can't really do it faster than 15 minutes. Uh, so every time you run room uh, the, the Odyssey, it's going to take about 15 minutes. And then you're going to have to sit down and like, do I like this? Now, when you finally save this off, you have two speaker presets. You can either rewrite the preset that you're on or go to preset two or vice versa, depending on whether you use both slots or not. I'd like to have a few more slots than just two, but at least you have two that you can play with. So um, that's my feedback on the the Odyssey. Uh, so yeah, two surprises on that. A couple surprises on the Odyssey. Let me bring back my notes here. 
what I wanted to talk about with you. Uh, so we're using the tripod versus the rocket ship. Talked about the phase issues, uh, the speakers to include, and then the large versus small. I'm pretty sure that was Odyssey that switched them to large. And, and that might account for some of the, the base issues that I'm hearing. So uh, very interesting there. Uh, the last point that I wanted to bring up here, and this is a very uh, subtle point. I remember looking at the cinema range when it first came out. And I think they had their other two channel products. Of course, last year they came out with the integrated amplifiers now. And on this part of it, I remember there was like illumination here with LEDs. And I said, mine aren't lighting up. And I know some people like it and some people don't. I suppose you could always turn it on and off, but I'm wondering, is there a setting that I'm missing? But then I went and looked at the Marantz website a little more carefully. On the AV10 flagship um, uh, processor, they talk about side illumination with LEDs. On the Cinema 40 flagship AVR, they talk about it. On the Cinema 50, they don't. So what I gather is they didn't put those LEDs on the Cinema 50, but they did on the top two units. So it was one thing that they're taking off. I know the Cinema 40 and the 50 are very close. I was getting questions on that even today that, um, you know, what are the real differences? Now, functionally, they're really quite the same. They're both nine channels of amplification. They're 11 channels, um, you know, a system with the four subwoofers. So you, you um, get effectively 15 channels of processing there. And the feature sets as far as streaming, as far as having an AM, FM tuner, all pretty much the same. What they advertise is slightly more output on the amplifiers. And they also advertise that there's better components. And they advertise that it's made in Japan versus Vietnam. And that's the advantages of the Cinema 40 and what you pay for uh, there. And as I recall, the differences in prices, they have um, the Cinema 40. Oh, I lied to him today. I said Q3, but I think it's Q2. I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, 2023. So you're going to have to, for the Cinema 40, you're going to have to wait at least another, you know, six months here. And that's going to be $3,499 versus the Cinema 50, which is basically $1,000 less. So is it worth an extra $1,000 to get the side eliminations, the a little more output made in Japan and the upgraded components. You know, I guess the one way to do is a side-by-side -side comparison once the others come out. But from where we sit today with not having the Cinema 40 available to us, uh, we, we don't know. And uh, yeah, those, those are the main advantages there. Is there any other... Um, Questions that the audience would like to ask here. I do see here, um, yes, chip shortages are still a real thing out there in the marketplace. Uh, but it has gotten a little better. And AKM has worked around, uh, even though some audio manufacturers have moved off of it, uh, they are uh, doing better with their supply uh, than they were uh, two years ago when they first had that fire. But not just the AKM chips, but just chips in general uh, are, are hard to come by. Uh, so more to come on our adventure here with the, the Cinema 50, as well as the RMC1. The RMC1 is, I'm getting very close to being able to, to put a test drive on this. I want to fine tune the Marantz Cinema 50 as much as I can with Odyssey. 
get a good sense on what I'm getting for sound quality so far. You know, it's it's a very pleasing sound. It's it's amazing uh, listening through uh, some streaming, some uh, ultra high definition Blu-rays, and and getting that immersive sound and 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 definitely the configuration that we have in here is very symmetrical and uh you know, it's, it's giving a it, it you know it's i'd be happy with just the cinema 50 the question is will i like the rmc one even more from a sound quality point of view obviously the morant has more features in there with streaming etc Yes, uh, we're all curious about the DAX in the Cinema 50. Yeah, um, so Oral 3D, what they're looking for is height speakers plus the Voice of God speaker. And that Voice of God one, the center one, is the only one that sits on the ceiling in a normal Oral 3D setup. And I just... Right above my main listening place, I've got these pipes that go across the room, and I just, I'd have to get creative. I'd have to hang a speaker external to the wall to make that happen. So I'll have to give that one some thought on the oral 3D. Because um, ultimately, I'd like to be able to report on that as well. Oh, you have a solution for me. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll look forward to that uh, that message. I'll be looking for it. Um, anything else that we want to cover today? Um, one thing I have listened to with the RMC one so far is I got my phonograph at the back of the room with the Parasound uh, preamplifier, and that is running balance cables back to the RMC one. And I did give that a test drive, and it, it does sound. Uh, quite a bit good. No noise, and it's going, you know, the full, uh, you know, whatever it is, 18 feet in this room. Plus going down the walls and up in the ceiling and all that. So, uh, you know, this is what we got today, uh, 42 minutes in. I do appreciate everybody listening in on this Sunday evening. I'd like to get it earlier in the day, uh, I'm just learning still a lot about these processors and these receivers, as well as learning how to do the, the streaming. And I was very close to having this set up where I could actually share my screen and, and everything. Um, I've got it working about 80%, but that's not good enough for a live stream. So I reverted just to the single camera for today. Uh, so hopefully this has been valuable to you. What I'm trying to do is give you a little more insight and rather than just saying I plugged it in, it worked great. I want to I want to reveal where I've had challenges and what I've learned and uh, things that may not always come out in a normal review. So thank you for listening. And as we go along here, just you know, feel free to take a look at um, other videos that we have out there posted. We do have the Patreon site, uh, www.patreon.com slash RipeWave. Uh, I really appreciate those who have uh, signed up for that because it helps us uh, with the funding of what we're trying to do here. This is kind of a self-funded channel. Uh, we've gone and added other features like a thanks button on our videos. Uh, so that is live now. And, and what do you can do to contribute even if it's just putting comments and those are quite valuable. Uh, the more of that you participate in the chats and everything that helps the whole group out here. And I do my best to answer everything, but you know, I, I miss a few every time. And I, I apologize if I didn't miss anybody's uh, questions as they've come in, but I'll um, see if I can get to those in the future. So until next time, and I'll just take a look here. Is there anything else? Yes, I am happy so far. I think um, for the money, the $2,500, the Cinema 50 is um, a well-rounded product, feature-rich, and um, really puts out acceptable results, and it's a stable product. And it is, um, and I find it's very good looking. Uh, 
and I, I think the RMC one is a different animal and I, I like that equally, but you have really haven't got into uh, its usage. And like I say, I'm waiting on those, the, the external amplifier for that. The XPA three, um, yeah, three meaning third generation, 11 channel. Yeah, that's, um, that's pretty nice because you've got a full set of uh, channels. They're all in one box. And uh, I've been, my goal is to eventually have on the ear level, everything fully differential, um, just as kind of a reference baseline, and then compare that against things that are not fully differential and see how much of a difference that does make. So that's, I'm looking, definitely would like to get eventually the DR series uh, or something from uh, ATI makes a lot of good fully differential amplifiers. So I guess that will end it for today. And as I always say, uh, keep evolving your audio experience. Thank you very much.